We're going to get into the final lesson. Final. All right. Final lesson on John, chapter 21. We've uh, had what? This could be the 23rd lesson now, I guess. We're pulling out all the stops for the finale. Yes. It's going to be good. Oh, wait. Pulling out all the stops. There we go. We got to bring out B. B, B. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't be complete without B, B, would it? Oh, you want B, B down there, huh? Okay, and then, and wait. Dress up like a fool for this one. All right. Send B. Go, B, Leaf. B, Leaf. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Final lesson. This time, the belief of poor fishermen. So as mentioned in our last lesson, this anticlimactic chapter appears to be an epilogue. Yeah, written by John numerous years later. Uh, deathbed perf uh, confession, perhaps, but I doubt it. Now, Carson, D.A. Carson, suggested this little addition to his memoir, to John's memoir, was likely published around the very same time as the Gospel of John, or else it would not have been accepted by the church. And since we have very little evidence of similar epilogues, although the final chapter of Mark it appears to be an extremely similar epilogue. And it's not like we haven't seen the church accepting various little additions now, is it? Mm -hmm. Like the woman caught in adultery. Now, regardless of this confession of sorts from John, of an additional meeting with Jesus, is pretty profound. It's a divine meeting used to reconcile Peter with Jesus. Uh-huh. Not only that, it's mostly a meeting to embolden the disciples for the most part. Embolden them. Well, most of them anyways. Four of them don't appear to need that because they're not there. It's only seven disciples at this point, at this meeting to embolden them to preach forgiveness through belief in Jesus. Belief. Yeah. To repeatedly preach a certain forgiveness from the great I am. Which is what they did soon after going back to Jerusalem. Immediately after receiving a mighty indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, after receiving that marvelous end game. Oh, 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 you remember we were into that? Oh, we were into Marvel Walt long before the end game. Remember that? And unfortunately, they didn't bring the Fantastic Four back, I heard. Oh, dear. <sighs> Marvel. Now, this confession of John's was likely written numerous years later, since there are numerous unique words used in the narration here. 28 unique words that are admittedly of no consequence whatsoever, with the most unique problem of Jesus now addressing the disciples as friends, hmm, instead of as children. But then that's not altogether new now either since we see in Matthew that he had addressed Judas Iscariot as a friend even. What? Judas Iscariot. So it's not unique. So not necessarily because of a unique author now for our final chapter, because our, because our vocabulary and grammar can evolve pretty rapidly at times. Just think of how our vocabulary has evolved over the internet age of the past decade or two and how it might have evolved following John's getting out of Jerusalem and getting out of Galilee, even. No. 
John is not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. His vocabulary has expanded. Now, this is a rather embarrassing confession, since those disciples were pretty lame in their faith yet, and pretty lame in their obedience as well, as mentioned in our lesson of Luke 24 that you can refer to, which in which those disciples were repeatedly told to return to Jerusalem by Jesus, which all of them finally did. All of them finally did, as we can read in Matthew, that Matthew reference there. Whereupon they decided to go fishing on the Sea of Galilee again. Oh, goody, fishing. We heard about that in the service this morning, didn't we? Fishing, in all likelihood, near Tabga. Tabga. What's Tabga? Oh, we have a certain, we were given a certain gift. Uh, a few years ago from someone who was in Tabga. Ah, isn't that sweet, eh? Isn't that sweet? By a certain, yeah, Jeff Gardner actually, who was on leave after Afghanistan. Pretty sweet. Two fishes. And, uh, I don't know, I don't see five loaves there, but Probably there somewhere. Pretty sweet. Oh, and there's more. So, they, perhaps near Tagba, where the disciples were traditionally called, supposedly. They were called there. And that's where 5,000 men were fed earlier with those five loaves and two fishes that we can read, we read about in John 6. And that's a pretty constructive thing for those disciples to have done, since they were waiting for Jesus to show anyways, especially constructive if you are hungry and broke. And they were pretty terrible at fishing, once again, despite fishing at night, despite picking on sleeping fish. Yep, sleep fish a lot, uh, fish sleep a lot. They got skunked again, yeah. Now, this had happened to those seasoned veterans before. As you recall, they got skunked in Luke 5 as well, until Jesus told them when and where to fish, surprising them with boatloads of fish, as we heard this in the service this morning, prompting a convicted Peter to fall on his knees. Yes, fall on his knees and say, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Hmm. And here we have a repeat performance from Peter. A repeat performance. Uh, well, a three-peat confession, if you will. On the third appearance to his disciples following the resurrection. The third appearance. Likely an appearance about a week following the previous appearance to the disciples, or about two weeks following the initial appearance, when actually the disciples served broiled fish huh? and possibly honeycomb to Jesus and he ate it yet the seven were so dull that they did not know that it was Jesus again not until they caught a boatload of fish again so many fish that they wouldn't fit in the boat they didn't know it was him, despite hearing him and seeing him about a football field away. Granted, the lack of daylight may have been a major factor in their dullness. It may have not have been a civil enough dawn yet. We went through that earlier. The sun may not have been peeking over the horizon yet, peeking over those huge hills of this below sea level sea. Or it may have been quite a reasonable dullness due to a long hard night after a long hard journey back home to Galilee again. Either way, you would think the voice would be easily, instantly recognizable. You would think, unless it was muffled by the waves of that sea since the white noise of waves is a pretty good sound masker. 
much like a veil or a cloak. Right? And mask your voice pretty well if that was the case. Yeah. So, then it was off to shore to have a proper shore lunch with Jesus. Lunch already roasted by Jesus. Barbecued fish on bread. Tilapia in all likelihood. Which you just might have the opportunity to sample shortly. Hmm. Which is often called the Peter fish. Which is a vegetarian fish that has really grown in popularity lately. It's uh, been tripled in consumption the last few years. Perhaps because it's a vegetarian fish. It does not feed on other fish. And not only the fish, but it seems Jesus also had some hot crust buns for them. Hmm. This is where we read of Peter's buns getting roasted. Yes. Roasted three times, just as he had denied Jesus three times. The parallel is unmistakable. No one disputes that. But to everyone's great relief, Peter is restored by a three-peat commissioning now. A commissioning having to do with sheep and lambs. But of course, we know Jesus was actually referring to people now, don't we? He was referring to making them fishers of men. And we can see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all knew that. Since those disciples were not shepherds, no, and they were not even great fishermen, it seems. They get skunked too. So here we see Peter being reinstated at, to being a shepherd, along with the deserting others, once again, which we read about in John 16, 32, which was a huge relief to all Seven, at any rate. With Peter then having no less authority than the other disciples going forward. No less authority. And certainly no greater authority as a result of some painfully extracted confession, despite what Rome has to say about it. So, what's all this stuff in this confession about lambs and sheep? in verses 15 and 16 and 17, right? What's all this? That age-old distinction that pastors tend to play with here. Hmm. Well, it is simply that, according to Carson. Play. It is a distinction without a noticeable, notable difference, according to Carson. So probably not worth comment, commenting on, but humor your pastor anyways. Just smile and nod. Okay. And what about all that love, love, love that we see Peter being questioned on in verses 15, 16, and 17? Well, here Carson says, contrary to our NIV, there are different loves being mentioned here, but they too are distinctions without a notable difference. So good on our NIV for not distracting us on that one. So I won't comment on that one either. And what about those 153 large fish? 153. Well, people like to speculate on that number too. Like it's got some profound meaning there. Saying that it, it, it's significant due to this and that. Oh, like 17 factorial or something like that. Or that there is some gematria involved, which is an alphanumeric code that they used to play with. But that significance would be entirely lost on those fishermen. It means next to little to me. So we're not going to comment on that silliness either. But what I would like to comment on is that Peter has to live with a pretty frightening prophecy over him now. Yes. A stretching out of his hands. Yes. A stretching out of his hands. That was widely understood as crucifixion. They all knew what it meant. 
A prophecy not unlike the prophecy that Paul had to live with in Acts 19, on 9, 16. I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. And according to ancient folklore, Peter and Paul were both crucified at the same together yeah, in Rome. A prophecy that Peter quite understandably took issue with. And then wondered if he might share a more, a more pleasant fate than the disciple that Jesus loved. To which Jesus gave the tart rebuke. What's that to you? And then Jesus piled on even more retort. Now it's likely that John wrote this little addendum of chapter 21 soon after Simon Peter's fate was fulfilled some three decades later. Quite soon after his execution, I suspect, since John was rather fond of revelations and fulfillments, and since John does not appear to be tardy in revealing those prophetic fulfillments, and you'll see a, a huge list where John likes to, to brag on those fulfillments. So not tardy in revealing the prophetic book of Revelations either. And likely not tardy in revealing this prophetic denial of Peter. His dear friend Peter, as we saw earlier in John 13. No one disputes that this denial was revealed by Matthew, Mark, and Luke in very short order. So why would John delay in revealing it? There was simply no hiding this terrible embarrassment. So this chapter might actually be a eulogy of sorts to his dear friend Peter, a sweetening of the pot following Peter's finally realized execution, when such prophecy would then not be self-fulfilling, would not cause Peter to be stretched out to fulfill yet another prophecy. And then John really stretches credibility here. John finishes off his chapter with a really, on a really cryptic trajectory, suggesting that Jesus did numerous other things, things worthy of vast number of books. This is nothing. We're talking vast numbers of books here instead of a brief book that you were memorizing. A world full of books, John speaks to in verse 25, which would certainly be the case if, in fact, he were the great I am. Yeah. John is kind of subtle at times, isn't he? But of course, these very brief things that are written by John, they are written by John, that you may believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, the great I Am. Once again, that by believing you may have life in his name, as we saw at the last verse of last chapter. Which leads to my final question for you quizzers, a question that was asked in our Bible study group yeah, I go to Bible study group too, yeah. The other day, a question for us more mature believers. The study, are you truly believing in him? Believing in who he truly was? In who he truly is? Or are you just believing on him? Believing on his finished work? Well, in just so happens to be our current way of speaking, our NIV, while on is more of an ancient way of speaking, the King James Version. And there is no notable difference whatsoever. Though believing on the finished work of anyone other than the great I am is, a, is fatally inadequate fatally. So don't be doing that. Don't be immature. 
Let that guide your belief going forward. Let that guide your belief in Jesus being the Word. The Word was God. The Word was the great I Am. No. John was comprehensive and complete. Totally consistent in here. Even without this final chapter. Even without this subtle very subtle final comment of Jesus being the great I am. May you live by that great I am belief. Amen.